Why are no activists asking for reparations from the African states that were equally complicit in slavery? Had they stayed in Africa, the lives of their descendants today would be unquestionably worse. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing a speech from Rafe Hadel Manku, who is a historian that left these Cambridge woke students absolutely shell-shocked when he was spitting pure facts about slavery and colonialism. So with that, let's get into the clips. He's an undoubtedly one of the factors that's contributed uh, to this increased passion is the emotion that envelops topics like colonialism and empire. And I say this also as a child of empire. But, you know, in recent months, we've seen the issue of slavery and colonialism expand beyond campuses as we've now got, of course, from Barbados to Jamaica, prominent Caribbeans are also calling for Britain to pay reparations for slavery and the consequences of colonialism. And Madam Speaker, were we engaged in this debate in 1807 or 1833, I likely would have crossed the floor to support the motion opposite, because, of course, the victims of the horrendous horrors of slavery would have been alive and deserving of damages. But it's not 1807, it's not 1907, it's not even 2007. Over two centuries have passed since Britain led the world as the first empire in history to abolish slavery and the right of reparations died long ago because reparations are fundamentally about matters of tort law. The purposes of damages, restoration of reparation is to restore the victim, the slave, to the position they were in before the damage occurred slavery the actual victim only can receive damages not their descendants and therein lies the rub because some six or seven generations separate those alive today from their british empire slave ancestors and whilst not just yet thank you so much whilst it's undeniable that 19th century slaves suffered unspeakable horrors in what way can this lead one to conclude that their great, 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 great grandchildren are also victims and deserving of reparations too. On the contrary, from Britain to the Caribbean, the descendants of slaves today have a far better and higher quality of life than they would have had had their ancestors remained in Africa. And that's an indisputable fact. Well, if you let me carry on, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. But first I ask you, is a current descendant of a slave ethically entitled to benefit from their ancestors' sufferings? And who should pay? Is it ethical for an innocent person today to be culpable for the sins of their forefathers? Now, CARICOM, which is the Caribbean body calling for reparations, wants British taxpayers to pay. But why? Out of a population of millions, there were only 3,000 slave owners in Britain. The vast majority of the population of Britain descend from people whose lives are one of abject poverty and hardship, working in hellish conditions akin to serfdom. Why should they, as taxpayers, pay reparations? It's not just yet. Thank you so much. 16% of the British population is now also foreign-born. So why should they pay for reparations? What about the descendants of slaves living in Britain today? Why should people from Trinidad and Tobago living here pay reparations to people in Jamaica? Six or seven generations is what separates those who are alive today from the absolutely abhorrent act of slavery that their ancestors went through. That is how far some people are willing to go to try and paint themselves as victims as they sit in their homes with central heating and send tweets from their iPhone 14s. And Rafe makes a great point that in the last 200 years since slavery was abolished, the demographics of countries like Britain and America have completely changed. And there is no good argument that suggests that people who are alive today have any culpability whatsoever for the acts of people who are supposedly their ancestors, especially considering that, like he said, only a small portion of the people alive back then were even slave owners. And even if reparations were a good idea, which they're not. It is such an impossibly complicated situation with such a vast jungle of different factors. It would actually be logistically impossible to find out who exactly is supposedly responsible and should pay those reparations and who exactly should receive those reparations and why and how much. Then again, why is the demand for reparations always 
focused and framed in terms of Britain? Why are no activists asking for reparations from the African states that were equally complicit in slavery? Should they not pay reparations? They provided the slaves that were transferred over the ocean and millions more slaves were kept in slavery in Africa by other Africans, just as were being transported across the Atlantic. Why does nobody ever actually speak about that unpleasant truth? What about the Arabs and the Muslims who bought and sold African slaves for centuries before the British arrived and continue to do so into the 20th century until the British and the French tried to stop it? And indeed, what about the slavery that carries on today? The International Labour Organization says that currently approximately seven in every 1,000 Africans is a slave. 10 million people. In 2017, CNN reported hundreds of slaves are sold every week in Libya. So much energy is given to historic reparation and the historic plight of slaves. I would have more time for the argument if the people were actively, actively pursuing that course of action were equally vocal about surely the far more horrendous plights of slaves today, where there are more slaves today in bondage, in slavery, than crossed over the Atlantic. So where are the protests outside the Nigerian High Commission? Where are the protests outside the embassies of Niger, which has 800,000 slaves today? What about Mali and Chad and Sudan and the Cameroon? It's almost as if there's an ulterior motivation behind the call for apologies and reparations exclusively from Britain. And how far should we... No, I, I would love to, and normally I would, maybe a bit later on, but I'm getting into the swing of things now. <laughs> why do we only hear about the Atlantic slave trade and why white people are so horrible? Due to the brainwashing of the education system and mainstream media and academia, people today are incensed by the Atlantic slave trade, as if it were a historical phenomenon that was unique to America. And narratives of generational guilt or white guilt or collective guilt or whatever you want to call it are being peddled relentlessly to the point where young people today don't actually know that slavery was a practice that was happening worldwide and cross-culturally throughout history until those evil white people abolished it. And like Rafe mentioned, slavery still exists today. But it's a very, very inconvenient truth for those who want to peddle the narrative of white guilt and peddle the racism narrative. Because the fact is that it's happening in Africa by African people, which flies in the face of the narrative that white people are uniquely evil and horrible and should be living our lives in a perpetual state of repentance for the sins of our ancestors. The facts completely disprove that narrative. So what do they do with the facts? They ignore them and they hide them. And anybody who tries to argue the facts gets called a, you guessed it, racist. And one of the questions that I've had personally thrown at me a few times is that, well, white people have never been oppressed. White people never experienced slavery. So you don't have a right to talk about this. Well, Rafe is about to cover that idea and then I'm going to expand on it even further. And how far should we take this? Should Britain seek reparations for the Barbary slaves? One million Europeans, at the same time as Africans were going over the Atlantic, one million Europeans were enslaved by the Ottoman states of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. And it carried on after the abolition of the slave trade by the British. Should Britain demand reparations from North Africa? Of course not. It's time to move on, and so should we. The Barbary slave trade, you may have never heard of that one. One million people, or according to Ohio State University professor Robert C. Davis, 1.5 million white Europeans were captured and sold into slavery between the 16th and 18th century. These people who were captured by the Barbary pirates were taken from places in the Mediterranean basin and even as far as Ireland. And then they were brought to various parts of the Ottoman Empire, which included Northern Africa, and put to work if they were lucky. But the unlucky ones had to endure the short and very miserable existence of being a galley slave. The ships that the Barbary pirates used to use were called galley ships, and they were powered solely by slaves, human beings rowing the ships. And the worst part was that these people were chained to their oars and never allowed to leave. They would row from there, they would eat from there, which was normally leftover fish and rotten vegetables. They would sleep there, they would be regularly 
beaten and whipped, and they would even have to go to the toilet there. They would be sitting in their feces all day and the feces of other people around them. And you can imagine the friction from the oar and their bums on the wooden seats all the times and their thighs and their feet on the ground would cause them to have many open wounds. Open wounds that would be infected by things such as gangrene and maggots. And women were also sold into the Barbary slave trade. The unattractive ones would be given roles in the kitchen and other places, and the attractive ones would be sent off to high-status men to be a part of their harem. Now, not much is made of the Barbary slave trade. In fact, nobody really discusses it, and I wonder why. And also, the word slave comes from the word Slav, which refers to the Slavic people because they were so often enslaved, and they're pretty white. And now, this is not to say that there should be some pity party for white people. This is to say that History is a dark and bloodstained series of unbelievably terrible and unthinkable events in today's context. We should be grateful that things are better now. We should be trying to create a better future for us and also for other people around the world who are still experiencing extreme poverty and lack of access to clean drinking water and expensive and rising energy prices which are causing famines around the world as we speak. If we're sitting around in our wealthy western countries with our central heating on, trying to pretend that we're victims for things that we've never experienced, then we don't make any progress. And there is a lot of progress to be made. And if we're victims for things that happened historically to our ancestors, then guess what? everybody is a victim and we should all just be sitting around in an orgiastic circle crying perpetually but let's turn away from slavery and expand our view to colonialism more broadly what disadvantage has colonialism actually caused to those living in the former british colonies of the caribbean and disadvantage compared to whom and this is to go back to the point that you asked most of the former colonies of the Caribbean are now successful middle-income countries. The GDP per head of the Bahamas is higher than Portugal and is comparable to Spain and Italy. You never hear that, do you? Barbados, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis and other former British slave colonies have higher rankings on the UN's Human Development Index than Brazil, Mexico or many other Spanish-speaking South American countries. How has the British Empire disadvantaged the Caribbean nations? It's not clear to me. But let's test this further. And let's go and look and compare the nations of the Caribbean with modern West Africa, the original homelands of Caribbean slaves, to see what life is like there. GDP per capita in Benin is $1,430. In Barbados, it's $17,000, over 10 times higher. Life expectancy in Benin is 62, in Barbados it is 79. <coughs> Rather than writing checks to well-off areas of the world, why not focus on countries and areas that are actually impoverished and require aid? Financial aid not attached to alleged attempts to cleanse one's soul. It can't, it can't be clearer. While slavery was abhorrent for those who were enslaved, had they stayed in Africa, the lives of their descendants today would be unquestionably worse. So what exactly actually is Britain being asked to pay reparations for? Because Britain wasn't the first empire in Africa, in the India, in the Americas, but it was the most benign, and, ben and the benefits from it far exceed those, for example, of the Islamic and Indian empires that carved up India, of the Ashanti empire, of the Dahomey kingdom, and all of the hundreds and thousands of slaves that were ritually sacrificed every year in Benin, and the Benin Bronzes were mentioned. The Benin Bronzes commemorates those who actually owned slaves. So whilst on, one, on the one hand, I can understand why you would protest Coulson's statue, why is there a celebration of the Benin Bronzes when they also commemorate slave owners? So why are we apologizing for Britain? Are we apologizing to Britain for introducing nutrition and food storage policies that led to a decline? in the subcontinent's processes of famine that happened every 40 years in India there was a famine. The population of India soared from 170 million to 450 million over the course of the Raj because of medicine, health and accurate and proper nutritional standards and food storage compared to how it had been. There had never been in the history of India such a surge in population growth. And let's not forget also what Britain did for women's rights because I think it's fair to say that it's thanks to the British Empire that we have had the progression of women in Africa and India through society. Because, of course, India's history is one of female oppression. It was the British who abolished sooty 
the burning of widows on the funeral pyre of their husbands. It was the British that stopped the infanticide of young girls. And it was the British who allowed Hindu widows to remarry. I'm sorry if you don't like the facts, but facts are actually facts. Universities were brought into Africa and India by the British. It is quite a, there, will be no, there will be no system of democratic legislatures within these regions. As Steven Pinker has written, pre-state societies before the British Empire arrived were on average far more violent than even the most brutal of modern states. So whilst many wrongs were committed in the 19th and 20th centuries, the modern success of Britain's former colonies today in the 21st century is due in large part to their colonial inheritance. The English language and the common law that enable them to become global players, their civic institutions, the police, the military, the civil service, the judiciary, parliament, universities, every region of the world you go to, British colonies are the ones most likely to be the most developed, the wealthiest, and the most democratic. I therefore have no opposition in opposing tonight's motion, but I'd like to end by quoting the great black civil rights activist and socialist Bayard Rustin, a friend of Martin Luther King Jr.'s and posthumous recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama, who said, if my great-grandfather picked cotton for 50 years, then he may deserve some money, but he's dead and gone, and nobody owes me anything. So in terms of British colonialism, there were many parts of it that were absolutely terrible. But there were also some benefits, and in a place like India, that is manifestly true. And it might make some people feel uncomfortable to hear that, but it's a historical fact. He mentioned that they got rid of the practice of sati because of the British. And the practice of sati is when a woman is widowed, she's burnt alive with her deceased husband. And in some cases, this was voluntary and it was seen as an act of bravery for Indian women. But in many cases, it wasn't voluntary. It was required. And then he mentioned the act of female infanticide, which is the act of killing your daughter. And unfortunately, to a much lesser extent, it still exists today. And the reason why they would do this is for financial reasons. The bride's family is expected to pay what's called a dowry payment to the groom or his family. And with the Indian caste system, the status of a woman's family is greatly affected if the woman doesn't marry a man who is of equal or higher social standing to her. Female hypergamy India style, and the higher the status of the man that they would marry, the more expensive the dowry payment would be. And considering that one of these dowry payments is the entire life savings of a family, having two daughters was thought to be financially impossible. And according to the New York Post, the practice of infanticide was brought to the attention of the British in 1789 by the residents at Benares. By the 1820s, government Al Finstone in Bombay established the infanticide fund into which fines were paid by those Indian leaders who failed to curb the practice and from which rewards were paid to those who did. Throughout the 19th century, a systematic effort was made to assess the extent of infanticide, primarily throughout northern India. In 1870, after careful and extensive documentation of the pervasive nature of the practice, India enacted the Female Infanticide Bill. This presumably provides the legal basis for controlling the practice to this day. Alas, cultural resistance to its enforcement remains robust. Rafe also mentioned that universities, civic institutions, and common law were all introduced to India by the British. And this is undoubtedly the foundations upon which India has built its current growing economy and why Indian GDP and life expectancy and infant mortality rates and quality of life has gone up so much. And furthermore, the British actually built things in India. They built great infrastructures and ports that are still there to this day. And they also introduced tea and cricket, which is a great Indian passion. No doubt colonialism was responsible for some terrible and ugly things throughout history. But in the British case, there were also some positive things. So in summary, reparations is a terrible idea and it's something that's pushed by individuals who want to look back in the past and say, I'm not where I want to be because of past injustices. And it's much easier to do that than to look at your life and take some personal responsibility. But more so, at a higher level, it's pushed by individuals who have very nefarious agendas and who choose to use certain historical injustices for their own political gain. And these sorts of narratives get us absolutely nowhere. There is so much progress to be made in the world and there is so much good to be done. And we should be looking straight ahead rather than in our rearview mirror. Thank you so much 
for watching. If you'd like to get at me on social media, then you can hit the link in the bio or in the top of the comments. And you can also join the community at Rattlesnake TV Locals, rattlesnaketv.locals.com. And if you like that video, then here's another one. And if you want to subscribe to the channel, if you haven't already, then click right here. Until next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.